Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, and it is a real pleasure to be here, and certainly uh, thank you again to Paul and to the event organizers for the invitation to be here and the opportunity to uh, chat with you. Uh, one of the things that's gained a lot of attention over the last several years is this concept of open online courses. And probably one of the driving aspects of it now, it, in moving it to, I think, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, can now comfortably de uh, be declared the, the educational technology buzzword of 2012. Uh, it's hard to get away from them. Uh, there are, uh, I think it's not much more, you know, almost daily basis I'll get, uh, you know, an email or a request for commentary from some media outlet on some aspect of open online courses. So it's gotten to the point where there's a lot of people who are paying attention to it. And I think, uh, and I, I want to talk a little bit about what are these things and what does it mean perhaps educationally. The difficulty I think around certain educational concepts, communities develop their own specialized language and their own approach to interacting with one another. It's always difficult when a concept sort of breaches the boundaries of a community and jumps into a whole new space. And that's what's happened over the last several months with the development of MOOCs and open online courses. And I'll provide sort of, I'll do a meandering uh, review of some of the MOOC activities that are going on now, some of the projects that are beginning to impact education, where some of these things might go. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, you might have heard of numbers, you know, 150,000 students in an open course, and you might say, well, what's the point of you being here? Uh, well, I hope the first point is for you to get caught up on email and uh, get your Twitter account set up. But the second point is that you don't have to have, you know, 100,000 students or 1,000 students or even 100 students to learn from the open online course initiatives that are currently ongoing. What we're needing to do in the conversation is to transition the discussion from the, the things that catch a newspaper's attention. You know, huge numbers, rock star conference uh, presentations or professors or whatever else, uh, down to something that really emphasizes a solid grounding in effective pedagogy in effective learning science models. So, how many of you have signed up for an open online course through Coursera or Udacity or edX? Has anyone signed up for one of those? Oh, repent. <laughs> okay, there are a few. Um, how many of you have heard of Coursera? Let me try again. I'll, I'll go with the negative approach, which you're never supposed to do as a teacher because it calls out ignorance on the part of the population. But uh, I'll do it anyway. How many of you have not heard of Coursera? Oh, good, there's a few brave souls. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Coursera and Udacity, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So I'll just take a little bit of a step back in, or in, in providing this discussion. And then I'll try and uh, provide some historical context as I'm going through this as well. So first of all, what is a MOOC? So a MOOC has been defined as a massive open online course, and I'll clarify that in a little bit more detail in a few slides. But uh, there has been a lot of attention to these course formats where major publications, New York Times, uh, you know, USA Today, the Chronicle of Higher Education, academic journals, uh, they're all calling these uh, ideas of open online courses as a fundamental disruptive force to the educational sector. And by fundamentally disruptive, and I hate the word disruptive, I should go on record as saying that, there's a few words that should be banned. Paradigm is one. I mean, paradigms, they occur every other week, but if you read Kuhn's original text, they occur once every hundred years, but that's off topic. Um, but nonetheless, they've been called these amazing forces that are going to completely change what education is all about. Or even less boldly, the fact that MOOCs are going to be big in the same way that Google was big. And I don't think this is an understatement, actually. I would, I would actually state that this is a very realistic statement of where I think or what I believe the long-term impact of this course format will be. And then there's others, equally breathless statements along the lines that these are, right now, MOOCs are the most uh, important experiment that's going on in higher education today. And then you have others who are starting to say, well, these MOOCs that you speak of, they're not as attractive as you like to say they are. Uh, there are huge costs to these open online courses, namely in de-skilling the professorate or in starting to impersonalize the learning process and reduce it to an automated, uh, robo-graded kind of an experience. And there's others who have very 
actively or accurately I should say detail that you know what if you look at the major MOOC providers and by major we're talking uh, I'll split these out in a little bit more detail in a bit but uh, there are three primary significant initiatives uh, there's Udacity which was a uh, spin-off out of uh, MIT the person that heads Google's driverless car research he's heading up Udacity uh, there is Coursera which if you go to the course I'll, I'll do this in a little bit I'll log on to the Coursera site you can have a quick look at what's there uh, I, it's absolutely my current addiction is signing up for courses that I actually don't take um, but uh, the, so these are the, the MOOC providers and the third one is edX which is the Harvard MIT initiative that's probably the one I would say is most important to watch even though they've had the smallest impact but they're also the ones that have 60 million dollars behind it so um, these course formats, the people who are running these and developing them, they are not the learning scientists. They're not the curriculum or learning designers. This is primarily being driven by programmers and by individuals who have a very technical or scientific view of the world. And just before I go, I'll just take a brief step back and say there is an unbelievable amount of euphoria right now in Silicon Valley uh, around education. Uh, education is the sort of the last field to globalize as, uh, as Rupert Murdoch and others have somewhat famously said and so in Silicon Valley which has had great success and enormous revenue generated uh, impacting fields such as journalism, newspaper, media, you know with YouTube and other projects, Google and search, the brain power within that community now along with most importantly and this is something that was mentioned earlier not just the brain power but the economic funding is shifting, the venture capital dollars are shifting into this space. So there are an incredible amount of educational startups being developed in Silicon Valley and they're very rapidly moving through the education space for adoption. So there, there is the Silicon Valley ethos which is driven by a few things. One is an incredible optimism that everything can be made better. That's probably the defining Silicon Valley trait. That's why we have iPhones that after a year we're not happy with anymore because there's a newer and a better one. So that's the, the Silicon Valley mindset is that everything that exists now is imperfect and will be better next year. So the approach to higher education is driven by that ethos that says it's broken now we're going to make it better. Uh, the second aspect Silicon Valley that's driven by venture capital dollars which means it's a very heavy uh, corporate slash capitalist context. I'm, I'm saying this in a neutral sense, uh, not, not putting a value statement on that. That's just how it is. It's a venture capital driven community. And uh, thirdly, it has sacrificed many dreams and hopes on the altar of technology and the future of humanity as a technically integrated species. So with those three mindsets, that's why MOOCs are sort of gaining the attention in this space and are coming from this space largely. So what is a MOOC? Well, essentially we'll look at each of these, these uh, attributes of it, but they're massive, maybe, not necessarily, but they often are. Uh, secondly, they're open, uh, but open is starting to mean something relative to what it perhaps has meant from the two conversations we saw this morning. Uh, looking, they're not open educational resources necessarily. You've probably heard of the famous statement of openness being, you know, this notion of free as in beer, not free as in speech. So you can access it for free, but it doesn't mean you can, you know, ex you know implement the four R's uh, with the MOOC content that's being generated by Coursera and by other sites. Now, there are some that you can do that with, but the big ones that are gaining the attention, you cannot. Uh, they're online, that's the only definite aspect <laughs> that we can agree on with the, the four words here, so they are online. Now they're increasingly also offered with a blended component. Now I should mention, uh, those of you that still teach exclusively in a classroom setting, your students are already blending your learning uh, in, in your classroom, so that you might lecture at them but not have a significant online component. It doesn't matter where there's only classroom learners, students are adding a blended layer through their search for resources and the documents that they access and likely the conversations that they have with each other. So uh, MOOCs can also sit in a blended space. And finally, it's a course, sort of. Uh, it's not a course the way we've known them in the past. So you see a lot of courses on the Coursera website, for example, they'll run any range from about four weeks to about eight weeks. And uh, the 12 week course, it's just too long to think about something for 12 weeks straight for today's generation. And I find I'm in that uh, camp as well. So let's step back and do a little bit of a look at history. So uh, the, the notion of, of uh, MOOCs and massive open online courses, in 2007, and a lot of these, these names will be familiar with most of you, but David Wiley offered a small course, I think he had about 45, 50 people join him, 
Uh, it was an open course on openness in education, more or less. Then, uh, around that same time, Alec Koros, uh, toward the end of that year as well, started offering a course uh, which looked at social media uh, in education and similarly opened the course up and had roughly a similar amount of, of participants. In early 2007, uh, we offered, as the University of Manitoba, we offered an open online conference where we were looking at uh, you know, different aspects of social network learning. And so a lot of my experiences came from the conference we offered at the start of the year and then watching some of the things that Dave and, and uh, Alec did with their uh, own course initiatives. So in 2008, I was at a conference with Stephen Downs and I suggested, you know, why don't we take some of the thinking we've done around you know, connectivism, social network learning and do an open online course with this. So we announced this course in June of 2008 after a conference and started running it in September. And we ended up with, it was a dual model. We had students at University of Manitoba that paid to take the course. We hit our limit of students, 25 students. And then we had a larger number of learners that joined without fee. And uh, we ended up with about 2,300 students. And that's where uh, the term massive open online course uh, was coined in response to that. Uh, so since then we've run, I'm guessing, about a dozen uh, open online courses all together. I think at last count I've had about 25,000 participants through those courses, but that doesn't mean they actually took the course, right? There might be three people out of that that took the courses till the bitter end. Most people sort of came in, took what they wanted, dropped out, or took what they wanted or didn't even get to where they wanted, got overwhelmed with life and just had a bunch of emails in their inbox that made them feel guilty each day. <laughs> then everything changed. Fall 2011, there was a course offered at Stanford in artificial intelligence. And so basically what they did at Stanford was exactly what we'd done with their open courses. They made not just the content, but the teaching freely and openly available online. And uh, the end result was they had 160,000 students join. And as a result, Sebastian Thrun, who led that first course, split and created a company called Udacity. And Stanford retained the Coursera model and that's where we are today. So in the last eight to nine months we've had about a hundred million dollars worth of venture uh, capital and uh, university funding allocated to this kind of a course format. You have sites such as edX which is the Harvard MIT initiative. They're promising to make their software, their curriculum and their teaching available for free. You have Coursera, which right now is promising to make everything, um, that the content available, but not the uh, particular uh, resources or technologies that they're using. So the development timeline, if you're interested, goes back really to MIT and in 2002 with the Open Courseware Initiative. Well before then, there were a large group of individuals that were playing with open content and other models. There's open conference series, that the TCC online, which is run out of University of Hawaii. That one dates back 15 years already. So you know, keep in mind, every brilliant idea is just uh, often one being presented to a new audience. And then more recently, like I said, you can see the, the, uh, the Coursera and the edX and uh, the Udacity models come out of it. There's huge issues that come out of this, everything from course completion, high dropout rates. But the interesting thing to remember is that those dropout rates, while they sound huge, MIT, when they taught their circuits course, stated that in that one iteration, the students that completed that course, were more students than had graduated over the last 40 years out of the MIT program. So you might say, well, you have huge dropouts in MOOCs, and I would say, sure you do, but you have enormous access opportunities that can't be discounted either. And uh, the same holds true with, I uh, just reading about Udacity, they had one individual, I think it was 13 years old, top honors in all the courses that they were offering, and uh, this is a 13-year-old from India that uh, just happened to be interested in this sort of thing and did very well with it. So it's an interesting way to surface new knowledge and expertise. So before I go into splitting out, after this I want to split this out into two separate models. The, the MOOCs that are more participant oriented and those that are more knowledge, traditional knowledge views. Uh, where the, the epistemological model is defined on you duplicate what the expert knows. But just before I do that, I just want to take you to the Coursera site so you know what I'm talking about in some of these uh, aspects. I always have to make sure you don't have a browser window open that says you were looking at something you shouldn't be. So, um, Coursera. No, I'm having browser problems. 
Okay, so Coursera is an initiative that started with Stanford. Since then, they have added an enormous amount of universities to their uh, delivery model. So right now, at last count, I believe they're sitting at uh, close to 16 universities. We're looking at Princeton, University of Michigan, University of Toronto, uh, Stanford, and a raft of other organizations that have joined in and are now part of the Coursera model. And so basically what they promote and what they try to petition individuals to, to be aware of is that you have these astonishing learning opportunities they've had since they formed officially, really was in, two th in early 2012. 2011 it was still sort of under a different model. They've had 1.2 million participants signed up. Now like with any good cults, you, you can't call them participants, they're Coursarians. So uh, they, you have to give them unique names. But the other thing they have right now is 121 courses. Keep in mind, this is a university that is about eight months old. And it has very much done exactly what the Google model did, which is completely destroy existing assumptions of what is valuable in a particular space. And by the time universities wake up to the Coursera model, I'm a bit concerned that these models will be so far beyond the university's ability to respond to that it will largely render many systems obsolete. So if you want to look at a few of these courses, if you started today, I mean, how many of you uh, would, con well, I won't even ask these questions because then people will put up their hands anyway, but statistics. 2013 has been declared the year of statistics, and I think most people are stunningly ignorant of statistics. You might have done statistical work uh, in your master's, and you might have played with a few programmer, uh, programs doing your PhD and otherwise, but chances are for most people, once you finish statistics, you quickly wanted to wash your hands of the whole mess and embrace qualitative research methods. And so uh, starting yesterday with Coursera, they just initiated an introduction to statistics course. Anyone can sign up for free. Other courses, gamification, model thinking, networks, friends, money, and bytes, that one starts next week. Uh, so it's an overview of networks. There's a social network analysis course that begins next year as well. And keep in mind, these aren't courses being taught by, by people who are just randomly interested in doing something. The networks, friends, and bytes, or money and bytes is done by uh, Princeton University. I took one previously that looked at complexity thinking, which was done by Scott E. Page, who's published heavily in the complexity field. And so these are individuals who are literally the knowledge defining individuals within a particular space. You know, web intelligence and big data and the list goes on. And if you're looking at particular categories, you have everything from business management, computer science, education, medicine, you name it. And these are courses, again, 121, 1.2 million users, a university that, a university provost or president that isn't thinking about these courses and worried about what this model says to higher education is oblivious to what's happening. We had, and hopefully it's okay to tell tales out of school, but we had a conversation uh, yesterday where we were looking at OERs and um, the discussion was on OERs and uh, one individual sort of stated, yes, OERs are important, we're beginning to plan for adoption of OERs and these are the things we're trying to do. And I, I kept having this overwhelming desire to run up and jump up and down and yell and say it's way bigger than OERs and anything that you're not going to implement in the next six months, your aspirations and desires don't count because the landscape is changing too quickly for you to take a year or two long mandate to, to explore an idea. But anyways, that's just my opinion. So, um, looking at some of these here, these are courses that if, if I was teaching a course right now in, uh, let's say, social network analysis within a university, here's what I would do. I would trash all of my course materials, I would use none of them, and I would tell my students, sign up at Coursera, take their course, we'll spend our time interacting around those content elements, I will mark and evaluate what you're doing, but trust me, their content is better than what I can produce within my university budget. That's the first thing I would do. And I would look at the courses that Coursera is offering and Udacity is offering and I would pick and choose and send students to those areas and give them a quality education beyond uh, what I could probably offer with the instructional design that I have access to, the video or the development tools that I'm able to use at, at Athabasca University. How does that make you feel? Let's pause and think about that. <laughs> Any comments? Uh, hit the mic and chat away. So I think what it would make one feel is that you're not doing your work and what you're paid for, but others are doing it for you. Not that, not that, that is what I believe, but I'm saying that's what you believe. 
And I would say that's called smart working. If I can get paid and get someone else to do my work, that's a hell of a deal. Other thoughts? What's your reaction to this? this these? And I'm not sure if you, and I, before I go into it too much, I mean, look at a few of these. I mean, you know, e-learning and digital cultures. Okay, so uh, now these are typically look at, they're shorter courses. Uh, there's fundamentals of online education, planning with applications. This is the Georgia Institute of Technology. These are five week courses. So they might not necessarily 100% replace an existing course, but they're a very significant part of what you can offer for your students for education. And uh, they're worth looking at as potential options. So if you look at their university systems here that they have involved, uh, they, they right now they've got a French university, they have, most of them are still American, elite American universities, and they've, they've got University of Edinburgh is, is also in, um, in the system as well. Uh, they do have the one in Delhi, but that's sort of the current scope. And I guarantee you, you're going to continue to see more and more universities join this. And the reason is, and this makes me extremely sad, uh, is that I think each country and each region should have their own initiative, right? So, because there should be an African MOOC initiative, and there should be a Canadian MOOC initiative, and there should be one, and there should even be provincial or regional areas. But right now, um, hopefully none of you are senior leaders in higher education, so I can say this. Um, the, the university model over the last 10 years has suffered from a dearth of visionary leadership. And that, I don't mean that with any one system. As a whole, the university system has failed to develop the capacity to respond to these very dramatic trends. And they don't come slowly. I mean, it's like these industries literally are transformed dramatically overnight. And so my concern has been that university leaders that have failed to develop the technological capacity of their systems are now forced to buy that expertise elsewhere. And they're buying it by purchasing product from Pearson, or they're buying it by joining Coursera rather than developing their own initiatives and their own technologies. That's what I mean is there's a lack of visionary leadership uh, globally within higher education. And there's a lot of individuals that are quite eager to fill that, that uh, lack of leadership with these kinds of course offerings. Now another example I just want to look at, like these are all very non-opinionated views by the way. Um, another one I want to look at is Udacity. Now Coursera is very much like a traditional university model. Uh, they do automated grading. They emphasize they'll have discussion forums that'll be involved as well so you can connect with others. And so it's a fairly integrated model. But each of those lectures sit at around 30 minutes. Uh, some are shorter, 15 to 30 minutes. Udacity, on the other hand, is a bit unique in this regard. Uh, they take short lectures, one and a half, maybe five minutes. One course recently on Introduction to Physics, they sent the faculty member, and this is what happens when, because I don't have this kind of budget, but they sent the, the person teaching the course out to Rome, and he would visit each of the major locations where major physics discoveries were made, and they sent him across Europe in different regions, and he would record the regions, he would talk a curator of a museum. I mean, you know, the last time that your university has given you traveling funds to go to Europe to develop an online course, uh, probably, well, probably hasn't happened. But uh, so that's sort of the option and the approach that they take because they see this at a different level altogether. And so uh, Udacity, similar thing, uh, they're shorter courses, much more precisely focused. And so a few examples, you know, let's say look at Intro to Physics, you have, they, they list how far along they are. In this case, it's beginner. Uh, web development, how to build a blog is an intermediate course. If you're looking at software debugging, software testing, introduction to theoretical computer science, and some of these, like artificial intelligence programming a robot car. My university does not offer this particular course, and I would suggest there's probably not many that actually do. And so if you go through the list of these, everything from making decisions based on data, which can be a more of a popular type of course, to very technically focused courses, such as, you know, algorithms and understanding uh, social networks. So these are the kinds of offerings. These courses run the gamut, everything from medicine down to uh, what you would look at humanities-oriented courses, even though they're heavily skewed toward the technical courses, computer science and related areas. So I'm just going to pause there just for a bit and get some reaction from your end. I mean, what's your take on these kinds of course formats and the fact that at this stage, these courses are completely available for free and chances are they're much better designed from an end user experience than what most universities have allocated for resources. So I just want to hear some reactions or sort of gut instincts to this. You know, I don't know if South Africa is unique in the sense that there's a huge, involved, complicated process of PQMs and approval. 
and this and that and this council and that committee and this qualifications framework and that higher education uh, group and whatever. Um, I don't think we're that <coughs> unique in that. But for something to be approved, it's not up to me as a teacher to choose it. And then, okay, I, you know, go sign up for Coursera and then I'll teach and assess and whatever. The whole thing has to be written down and captured in millions of forms and, and put out. Um, and they change yearly and then you have to update them to this and that and tag them on online and whatever. But I mean, do you see what I mean? How do, how do we get those two seemingly non-connecting <laughs> universes to connect to each other? Yeah. yeah. I, that's a very valid question. And I don't have the answer for it because it's one of systemic change. And higher, and you're right, it isn't, South Africa isn't unique in that regard. Uh, I've certainly had experiences where I've wanted to teach an open format course. There's one I'll list a little bit later on uh, where Athabasca required that uh, I teach them as two separate courses, even though they're the same course. One is for, you know, open for students who aren't paying tuition, but I couldn't cross link in my discussions. I could only encourage the four credit students to join this other course. So there's a lot of neat little issues that arise um, around open course format. So many universities, I think, see this as, oh, this is something new. This is just like all the other new things we've ever encountered, which means we're going to take some time and think about it and we'll have some discussions and there'll be a government mandate that'll come and that'll change what we do and so on. And I've tried to argue with universities I've spoken with is this is something that's new, but it's also new in terms of its pace and its potential rapid impact that it will have on, on education. Some of you might have heard University of Virginia, they recently had an odd situation where uh, when these MOOC courses, these, these initiatives were announced, uh, they, the, the director, the board of directors fired their, their provost because they said she just hadn't, she wasn't moving fast enough, she wasn't aware of these trends. And there was a huge faculty outrage and they had to, you know, she ended up being rehired again and brought back. And then wouldn't you know it, the next time there was a Coursera sign up with a new uh, sequence of universities, University of Virginia was on that list. So uh, there is that sense that some universities kind of get the message, but I'm a little worried that the, the universities that aren't getting it, the, there's a period of very valuable capacity building that's happening now. And if you get in early, you build capacity early, which means that the next change that happens, because technology layers on itself. So if, for example, you started playing with blogs when they first came out, then all of a sudden, podcast came out and you added that to your repertoire and then all of a sudden something new came out and you added that to your repertoire and then we had social uh, bookmarking and then we had YouTube and then you know we eventually had this continued list of eventually Facebook and Twitter and everything else. So you layered these skills on each other and each one had some familiarity with the one that was previous. So you're building almost this knowledge structure around social media. Which means that if you went through that whole process, when you find something new now, like Quora, which has gained a fair bit of attention recently, uh, as it's basically the best answers to the best questions on the web. It's a, quite a fascinating site. Uh, or another one is Pinterest, which uh, apparently if you're female, you're supposed to love Pinterest. If you're male, you log on and you wonder, okay. But uh, Pinterest is one of the fastest growing sites right now and it's about 80 some percent uh, female uh, as a resource. So when you've played with these sites in different ways, adding a new one on is much easier to deal with. The same holds true for MOOCs. If you've begun experimenting aggressively with online learning at an early stage, layering on a new competency or new way of interacting with people around ideas and information is much easier. So the short question or the short answer is that it really is about senior leadership and even government officials becoming aware of the velocity of some of the changes that are facing them. Now, I'd love to hear a counter perspective. I'd love to have somebody say, oh, George, that's a lot of hype you're throwing out. I'm not agreeing with you at all. Uh, or even just any additional views that you think I've uh, overspoken the scope of the threat. Yes. OK, I just want to know, what's in it for these uh, universities? Do they get? Um, marketing exposure or, or what's in it for them? Well, that's an unknown still. 
it's kind of like, but if you asked Google when it first came out of Stanford, what's in you making an algorithm available for people to search online and not charging for it, they really didn't know at the time either. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that Google's revenue model, that they, they stumbled upon it by mistake, and it was only developed after they had enormous numbers or enormous millions of users. So the experience with Coursera, and, and this is, I think, part of what baffles a lot of people, is you're expecting an economic model that makes sense. But the Silicon Valley doesn't make sense. What you need in a Silicon Valley model is an enormous amount of users, and even Twitter right now is still grappling with how do we make money off of our, the number of, of Twitter users that we have. So you have you know, hundreds of millions of people on Twitter, but they don't quite know how to make money yet. They've experimented with a few models. Some of them are starting to work a little bit, but they haven't sort of hit the gold mine yet. Facebook is another example. They've got almost a billion users now, but at this point, they're still grappling for that one killer monetary outcome. So if you're expecting Coursera and Udacity will you know, eventually uh, run out of money, then I would say in the world of, of technology startups, as long as they're gaining users, they're going to gain venture capital dollars with the hopes that eventually they'll strike it rich. So what's the point then, I, more to your questions, what's the point of someone joining Coursera? For Unisa or for any other system, it's a variety of factors. One, you don't want to be seen as being left out. It's actually almost cult-like behavior. Uh, premier universities, if they start to see, oh, okay, Princeton's there, Stanford's there, U of Michigan is there, why isn't University of Virginia there? Right? So it's almost like, I don't know, Mean Girls or something, uh, you know, the, in, in the educational equivalent. And similarly, you also see the, the segregation edX, which is really the big, I mentioned earlier, it's the initiative to watch because it's the one that has $60 million allocated to it. Coursera is a for-profit venture or they want it to be for-profit. Udacity, similarly, it's a startup. edX is an academic activity which means that, in my eyes, I think edX is going to do significant damage to the for-profit university sector. And the reason being that with edX, Harvard and MIT are saying education is our space. We can do it for free. We can do it with our resources. And even Coursera and Udacity combined don't, have, uh, the, the re don't even have half the resources, really, of what's being allocated by MIT and, uh, and Harvard. University of California at Berkeley just joined that initiative. So the benefit to a university may be marketing. It may be student recognition. It may just be building capacity around teaching with technology. But there's no economic model in place yet. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, um, institutions like Udacity and Coursera, for instance, they offer plenty of modules or subjects that you can refer your students to, like you've pointed out. But obviously, there are also, um, they're also plenty of uh, subject fields that they don't offer. Um, let's say, for instance, African languages, which means that you can't refer your students to that. So my question or my you know, interest would be either to how can I duplicate it or how can I contribute to Udacity, for instance? First of all, you can't to Udacity. Uh, it, it's, uh, there would prob at this stage, at least. I think they'll open up their Zedmodo and other initiatives that you can contribute to. Uh, that's why I strongly encourage, you know, a made in Africa MOOC or a made in China MOOC provider or a made in Australia or in UK or wherever. Uh, because uh, joining the Coursera MOOC, the way my perspective is early promising innovations need diversity of options so that the context can kill off the ones that fail. If you too quickly develop a sort of a homogenous model that everyone falls in line behind, there's an enormous risk that you haven't fully explored the field and you've made the wrong decision too early. And I'm not convinced that Coursera and Udacity yet have the pedagogical model for learning in a digital age. Uh, I'm hoping they don't because I don't 100% like it. But that's why it's, I think, important that individuals play. So if African languages is a topic of, of interest, I think it's, uh, it's incumbent upon universities to play the lead role in developing you know, a, a MOOC consortium that is to Africa what Coursera has largely been to US universities. And you're right. I mean, at this point, though, uh, with 1.3 million students, Coursera is one of the largest universities in the world. And with 121 courses available, they also offer a fairly complete complement of courses as well. So it's worth emphasizing that it's not that they're, and, and th keep in mind, they're a very young university. If they were a baby, they would not yet have been born. 
you raise an interesting point about underpinning pedagogy, because a lot of that comes out of America is designed from instructional uh, positions, behavioristically controlled. And we all know that that is not deep enough learning that occurs in those yeah. environments. You can, te you can very easily teach a skill, but can you actually te teach about the underlying philosophical or ideological positions that sit underneath? So what you were saying about the content, taking the content and then adding a, a, an appropriate pedagogy to, to, to navigate that is more important than, than, the, than, the, than the content. And this is a very big problem. Even I even think that the MIT um, uh, initiative is going to be driven by the pedagogy of instructional design. And it's only in America where instructional design has got everybody by the neck. There are places in the, the rest of the world that don't do that. I mean, Brazil doesn't do it uh, largely. Uh, in South Africa, it's a mixed thing. And I want to challenge the stuff about all the HEQC nonsense that we have to deal. Everybody fills in those forms, but who listens to them? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, we, we say things like, are we going to teach them problem-based learning, uh, uh, problem-based uh, uh, skills, but then we test them with multiple choice questions. So uh, I actually think that the university has a whole structure of, 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 of nonsense that very little people take any consideration of, because nobody tells me about the content. And we're also very good at writing these things in very generalist views so that we can change what we want to do, teach them. So, but I think it's, you are quite right to say it's about the pedagogy that is more important than than the actual thing. Yeah. And I'll get into that a little bit in the you know, sequence of slides I'll get out uh, shortly. Any other comments before we go on? You're all going to take your death very politely and quietly. <laughs> George? Yes. OK, so just to add to the debate, sitting in South Africa with uh, internet access with less than 20% of the population, and even less than that, academics themselves, who we struggle to you know, have any kind of involvement with the technology at all, how is this hype going to affect us? That's a very important consideration. And this is why it's exactly those kinds of things that assumptions are made in regions when they offer certain courses. So when I sit down and, and I've run uh, numerous open online courses and I try because I do a reasonable amount of traveling so I'm, f I'm aware of different regions of the world and the context of different regions. So I try not to be heavy and high bandwidth activity. So, you know, it, but even you're, you're taking it one step further and saying a lot of people have zero connectivity. It's not just that they can't watch a video, they can't even access a text page. So you're right, I mean, that's a challenge. And I think that's where, why the value of regional made here MOOCs, you know, MOOC providers are so important because there, it, would be, it would be a great travesty if the solution to bandwidth issues in South Africa came from somebody out in Berkeley in California rather than coming from a group of faculty members or in, individuals who are aware of the needs in Africa around that. So I think that's why MOOCs providers in different regions rather than joining these other big initiatives but developing your own is so important because you have unique contexts and unique problems that others aren't going to be aware of or even if they are they're not going to have a deep understanding of what does that actually mean in terms of design principles, cultural issues. Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors at play that a complex society such as the US or such as South Africa or such as UK or, or India, there's complex factors that you can't normalize across all of those regions with education. And uh, that's what the Coursera model does to a large degree, is it normalizes cultures. Okay. Oh, yes, Laura. So what worries me about it is it's not just that it normalizes and homogenizes, it also creams off the best of the best from everywhere. So it turns the world into this single place and the elite goes into this one US-based model and leaves everyone else to deal with the rest. You are absolutely right. And, and I've said before, I, I had an interview with, uh, with a lady from uh, New York Times and she was saying, well, what's going to be the impact of this? And I said, well, elite universities are going to be fine. The, the universities and the colleges that are more polytechnic oriented or that serve lower income individuals, they're going to be fine because they've had to build very strong social supports in because that's what their student base needs. The mid-tier systems are going to be screwed, which means you're going to see uh, an enormous gap in inequality in educational provision. And it probably shouldn't surprise anyone because to a degree globalization 
has that impact. It can make some very big winners, but it can also generate uh, some very big losers as well. And so I, I think you're 100% right. That's one of the things that I'm personally concerned about as well is what's going to happen now. We're going to have one person teaching social network analysis out of an elite university, but quite often it's having a lot of people playing with ideas and a lot of faculty members teaching in different ways that, that develops a discipline from a diverse, you know, multi-nuanced perspective. Uh, so you, yeah, you're right to raise that. And that's where the issue of, of superstar professors comes in. If you have a faculty member who teaches a million students, that there are costs to it on the one hand. It means students in India, for example, who couldn't access that quality of learning suddenly have great access to a really effective lecture. Uh, so that's the positive side. But very few things in life are all positive. Any change you make that has a good component, you also need to be conscious of the impacting components that are negative. And you need to ask yourself, is that investment or that transition worth the cost? You know, does the good outweigh the bad? Not just now, not just in the next year, but you know, in the next decade or even in the next century. All right, so with that, um, I should emphasize that some of these initiatives are quite creative. I think we're at a very much sort of a pre-Cambrian period in educational technology and innovation. Uh, so you have Udacity, for example, if you take an open online course with Udacity, you can actually get recognition for that course through a Pearson testing center. You go into a Pearson testing center, pay to, to take a test on whatever topic you had uh, done with, with uh, Udacity, and you can get formal recognition for that. Uh, one of the things that we had a discussion with at Athabasca as well is who's going to eventually accredit these courses? And will it end up being that you have a uni, you know, series of systems where one of the things UNISA might be able to do is provide uh, formal crediting for people who've taken these Coursera or Udacity courses, but they prove their competence through the system locally. And the example I've used, in that, or the term I've used in the past is that you know, we teach globally, but we accredit locally. And that may be a model that uh, universities end up adopting or moving toward. Okay, so I'm going to move on to kind of laying out the landscape in a little more detail. So we have two particular course models. Uh, one is the, what we, I would look at as, you know, the edX, uh, the Coursera, the X MOOCs. And then there's the, the other one I would look at as, uh, you know, C MOOCs. And, and, you know, that's how it works. When things get complicated, you have to start inventing a lot of jargon. And so C MOOCs are typically, uh, or have been referred to as connectivist style MOOCs. If you don't like that word, you can just call them creative MOOCs. Uh, but there's been a variety of illustrations of what this looks like. So the difference is Coursera very much duplicates the formal model but moves it online. It fails to take, it takes into account scalability and the economics of the web, but it doesn't take into account the creativity and the personal control of the web. So I, from my own view, MOOCs are really the first wave of the internet happening to the education system. And what edX and others have done is they've taken advantage of the scaling, many, many learners, but they've kept the pedagogical model, which essentially, and I'll, I'll deal with the pedagogical model shortly. Whereas in the open courses I've been involved with, we start with content as a beginning point, and we expect learners to create, to expand, and, and to generate artifacts of sense making uh, around that curriculum that reflects their own understanding. Put another way, Coursera has a traditional teacher-learner model. The teacher knows the learner's learning, and the learner largely is expected to duplicate or master what the educator has already said exists. I see it more so as a knowledge growth activity, more in line with uh, Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Breider's work on knowledge building. But it's, it is a changed relationship between the teacher and the learner. It heavily emphasizes distributed, chaotic, emergent activities, and the emphasis is on learners helping to contribute or to sort of grow a domain. Coursera then, centralized discussion forum support, CCK or the, the courses I've been involved with are a little less organized. They're a little more chaotic and frustrating for students. Um, so I mean, this is just a typical discussion thread, but the only problem is these are discussion threads where, you know, you, you've got, they have, they add things such as voting options to it, or they add things such as, you know, number of posts that have replied to it, or how many people have viewed it, but it's very much a centralized discussion board. And the activity that I'll get into providing a little bit more detail shortly will detail where, where we're a little bit different. But generally speaking, learners in both of these initiatives do some kind of work. So they have to do either formative or summative assessment. It could be automatic quizzes or graded quizzes, such as the Coursera approach. It could be assignments, 
courses I've done where the four credit students, I'll mark their submissions, but the other students that aren't taking the course for credit, I don't provide marking or feedback. Uh, they can certainly come along with the course, but there's no personalized feedback necessarily. I might have there's an interesting blog post or whatever, interact that way. The evaluation can be automated or graded or it can also be done on a peer level. Now the peer learning model for assessment doesn't always work very well. So you have people who will create something and someone will get, you know, 30 posts on their uh, or responses to their work, someone else will get none. Okay, so what do these open online courses from my perspective at least look like? Well, essentially we've adopted an approach that says, and this is reflective of just my own ideology, that, that knowledge is networked. Learning is a process of forming and developing these networks. And so we emphasize students own their own spaces of learning, whether it's a blog or whether it's a domain name that they have. Uh, but, or they can, if they want, they can use a learning management system. We found in the past that students create what they need. And so this is the notion of Reed's Law, uh, where, which states if you have a large enough broad network, people can subcluster and form individual network structures that meet their needs. So people might connect their own Spanish as a language, for example, or they might be, have a large group that's located in New York. They'll meet physically face-to-face -face as a study group, even though the course is online. And uh, in the, what we do is we aggregate all of the blog posts and interactions through tags and otherwise, and then we put it out as a daily email newsletter. Our emphasis then for the course is that content is fragmented. It doesn't just exist in the course. Knowledge is generative. Educators cannot whole mind implant competence or knowledge that I have into someone else's head. There needs to be a process of coherence being learner formed. Learners need to draw connections. And I always find it a little sad, I hate to say this because it's frustrating, but I find it a little bit sad when a student gets a beautifully packaged course because it means somebody's done all that hard thinking for them of saying what doesn't belong. Um, I like to flail a little more. Instead of sort of scaffolded learning, it's progressive flailing. Um, because you learn, the value in learning is figuring out what doesn't belong, not just in duplicating what belongs. And a few other elements around, you know, multi-spaced interactions and fostering autonomous, self-regulated learners. Unfortunately, for many people who want to offer MOOCs, these, these technologies are still very underdeveloped. Uh, there are, uh, I've heard of several initiatives now that have started up. Uh, CAPX, like K-A-P-X for Kaplan University. There was uh, just a new course I was reading today. It's called Newton, uh, Newt U, so Newt Gingrich from the, uh, the U.S. Uh, has a new uh, you know, massive open online course that uh, he offers through that particular platform. Um, and you have a series of startups that I've heard say they're doing, they're offering a MOOC piece of software. Uh, we'll see where it ends up. But right now, if you want to run an open online course, you basically have to build your own by pulling together a variety of tools that you think are relevant. But I've already talked about this point. Uh, these, these issues, the, they, there needs to be more of an export mentality with open courses. Is export your culture, your knowledge, your expertise, rather than just importing? Okay, so what happens in a MOOC? Well, a variety of things. Uh, so on the one hand, we found that uh, with the courses that we did, we had an awful lot of technology being used. And, and the slides are on SlideShare if you want to go into more detail, but the, this was in 2008, things have changed, but you know, Moodle was huge still, but uh, blogs were bigger, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twine at the time, Ning. Does anybody remember Ning? Um, we used uh, Ustream, PageFlakes was also somewhat used, Second Life, and social bookmarking, maps, RSS, Flickr. So there's a variety of tools that people were using in this particular course. We had a variety of countries represented uh, from different regions of the world. People would dive in and join in. And we had, uh, I gotta, this, this thing is uh, irritating me here. Let me just delete that because it wasn't supposed to stay. And so uh, nationality is different, uh, occupations varied. Some people were in education, some people uh, fit in a variety of different profiles. Now this is a very small N with this particular study, it was only 83. And uh, we had, for individuals who said, what's the most useful tool, the daily, which was the email that I mentioned, aggregated all the conversations. So the way it would work is you would provide your URL when you join the course for your blog. And then if you had the course tag in your blog, each day if you posted something new, uh, Grasshopper would, would aggregate it, run an analysis to see if that course tag was there. If it was, it would get pulled into the daily email. If it wasn't, that blog post didn't get included. So that way, if you were taking, let's say, three MOOCs at the same time, you could use the same blog as long as you had the right tag in each one and it would get pulled into the right daily newsletter. And Moodle, again, was still quite significant. We used Illuminate for live, 
lectures. It's now Blackboard uh, Collaborate, but it's basically just an interactive live synchronous classroom. One of the things we found interesting though is uh, there's a very, there's a striking similarity between what people did. The one big thing with MOOCs is they all die toward the end. I don't know why, but the momentum and the energy changes. Now, uh, so we found on the one hand that individuals in terms of their use of Moodle, blogs, and Twitter. Well, Twitter was more stable for the participants. The course facilitators, you can't really blame the learners when the course facilitators are similarly trending downward as well. Uh, so it just seems like as the course goes along, there's sort of a decreased involvement. Now that might be because of how the coursework has been designed. Maybe they're doing more writing and less blog posting and the early part of the course is heavy emphasis on social connectedness. People getting to know one another and so Twitter and blog posts are higher and once you begin producing more substantive work, you're going to see a decrease in social media and an increase in the sharing of knowledge artifacts. But uh, looking at this uh, analysis here, the uh, different MOOCs in terms of the length, as I mentioned, there's a variety of formats. Ours have tend to be around 10, 12 weeks. Uh, and um, the approach for surveying, in this case, we haven't done extensive surveying, but there's a growing amount of courses they, they offer. Even Coursera does this, but uh, early offerings of surveys to get a sense of who are the students and why are they taking this course. But again, the same illustration I talked about earlier. Uh, this edu MOOC, which was run by Ray Schroeder at uh, University of Illinois, uh, week one or week zero to kick off was 1,000, 270, 190, it would drop, and then sometimes you'd have an odd spike where the faculty member would try through sheer might and will to get students engaged because they felt it was their fault. And uh, then after that period, it would start to drop back down again. And this is a pattern that every single open course I've been involved with has followed to date. So that's a bit of backdrop on MOOCs, what they are, different kinds of formats of them, different lengths of offering. I'd like to turn now to those of you that are very eagerly and actively engaged in wanting to run a course of your own. And so I'm going to run you through a list of uh, nine easy steps for offering and running your own MOOC. And uh, unfortunately, this is going to be a text heavy uh, discussion. So there'll be some, some uh, you know, a lot of text on the screen, but I'll sort of try and talk to some of the experiences I've had in doing this and I'll pause after each point and just see if you have any particular comments or questions. So the first thing I think somewhat obviously is pick a topic and get a rough sense in your head of what your audience is. Now the only value of doing that, I mean you can't determine your audience because a lot of times it'll depend on who actually hears about it. So I would say in terms of topic, find something that maybe someone hasn't done before because uh, you, in, in the end, much like the internet broadly, you are competing for people's attention. So if there's 12 courses on social network analysis being run, you have more competition than if you're running one on, I don't know, prehistoric sex toys. I, that one actually would probably work quite well. I'm gonna make a note here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the topic of area is relevant. It needs to be something you have some expertise in and an interest. And also there should be an appeal or demand for this. Now it doesn't have to be huge. It could be a small group of individuals or researchers that you're involved with. Um, and if ideally, if you're already teaching it, just do an open online component of it. So let's say you're going to teach literacy uh, 101 and I don't know what that would look like in fall. Then just say, well, I'm going to open this course up. Uh, instead of doing what I've done in the past, I'm just going to take everything, all the lectures, I'm going to invite everybody into all the, the online sessions if you're holding those, and I'm going to ask others to participate in the activity. And it's also helpful to think about who would you target. I mean, if it's a course that's undergraduate level, you're likely going to be targeting students. You might just have people who are, you know, randomly interested in this topic. Let's say, for example, you want to teach a course in using R for statistical analysis. And uh, I mean, that's a course where you're going to have a very specialized subset of people that will participate. But you can, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, promotion is easier in that way if you have a very clear audience that you're going to be targeting. And, and again, it might be uh, just a matter of me, it's your academics or your peers or just someone who is still alive. So your topic and audience is one of these things that you go through the process. The topic is important, obviously. Your audience you can't really determine, uh, determine effectively up front. Any comments or reaction to this point one? Pretty straightforward. Second one, this I think is critical, is don't bother teaching alone. There's really no point in doing that. And so I would say find someone else to teach with. So maybe it's a colleague, ideally, just quickly going to correct a spelling error. <laughs> Ideally, it'll be someone from a different country, and it will be uh, someone who is a different region of the world. 
almost look like I said religion. That could in itself make it interesting. Uh, or someone just who has different views on the topic. I think it's the worst thing to do is if you're teaching uh, a course is to have everybody teaching it on the same page. Uh, I think it's nice to have different views, different perspectives because it helps learners understand the diversity of the knowledge process. And also wherever possible bring in guest speakers and video interviews. So what I did with courses I've done, and I typically, I mean, there's a few I've done a lot with Stephen Downs and with Dave Cormier, but uh, I've also done a lot of courses with, with other individuals where you find someone who you perhaps have some interest with. I've run a series of learning analytics courses with a different group of individuals, and uh, it's for the same reason. It's just to say different opportunities for learning and don't teach alone. Uh, it, it, you lose a lot of the value of the learning experience when you have a colleague you can bounce ideas off of. Now what I found is quite helpful as well is uh, with your guest speakers. Most academics enjoy talking and so if you have an opportunity you'll know who people are in your field, whatever your field is and if you're going to offer an open online course, if you're going to offer it in a, in, in a particular language and you're going to be able to access or get a hold of a few of your colleagues, uh, get them involved and chances are you won't have too many issues with it. Other thing you can do is if you're going to attend conferences in, in your field you know, your iPhone, you know, take a five minute recording and use that in your, in your course notes or whatever. Or, you know, three minute recording. It doesn't have to be much at all that you're using. But that way you bring in other voices and other ideas into the course. The third one, um, this is obviously an important aspect of it, but it's determining the content. So the question here is around, uh, if you're able to, I would strongly encourage use open articles wherever possible, even if you're teaching in a university. Uh, so if students have to go through login or through authentication process to get a hold of articles, you're going to lose even your four credit students in some cases. They might just not know how to you know, get an article from your university database. I and mean, that's an actual, I find this with master's students as well. So I think that's a reality that, that you need to be aware of. Wherever possible, I would say use a whack of different resources. You know, don't just go text, use video, pick stuff up on YouTube, Vimeo, wherever you find it. And another great area, treasure trove of educational resources are conference videos and recordings. A lot of conferences these days make uh, keynotes or conference presentations available after the, the event, the recorded versions. Use those as you pull your content together and link to that because that's where you're gonna find your most current research. Uh, or current thinking in that particular field. And uh, of course a big part is don't over plan. Your students need to be able to jump in, create and do interesting things as well. So treat this as a starting point though. Your content shouldn't be 100% what you want them to master. It should be your invitation to, for interaction with your students. Now you've already, with the uh, presentations that you heard this morning, there's a lot of discussion on open education resources. So I think a lot of the examples that were shared there for sources and sites to access provide you with a good overview of where you might want to go. And there was a wealth of ideas shared on where you can find different kinds of content uh, and OER resources as well. Thoughts so far? You're okay? You're three steps into your first MOOC. You're all doing very well. No objections so far. Excellent. This is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting is where once you've thought through your audience and your teaching partners uh, to start to look and, and your content to start planning spaces, the spaces of interaction. So, you know, what are you going to do in terms of centralized forums? Because even though I'm a big fan of distributed learning experiences, I find that a lot of students are not comfortable with that. They still want that. Give me that URL. So I'm not going to fall on my ideological sword on, on distributed learning. I would instead say set up a, a Moodle site or Sakai or whatever you use and give students the opportunity to interact in those spaces. Uh, but the important thing is also give them permission to move into other areas. So approach I've taken with courses I've taught over the last while at, through Athabasca. I uh, did one on uh, learning and knowledge analytics uh, last year and I started off with the first part of the course was, was, was still centric within the Moodle form. But the second stage of the course moved into the landing, which is a social network service that we offer at Athabasca, where individuals could blog and participate in other ways. So it's really the sense of, as the course progresses, it's not just content development, but it's literacy development as well, that students become more comfortable with a plethora of different kinds of tools. Uh, so again, that's why I emphasize, don't, don't say no to Moodle just yet. And also encourage students, because I think a big part of education should be the development of autonomous, self-regulated, uh, motivated learners so that they don't need to have the faculty member 
tell them what to do, but they begin to, very much in a sort of a Kantian sense, uh, they begin to do for themselves what others had to do for them in the past. And so uh, that should be an outcome of courses. So your, your course structure with MOOCs should start with, even if you have to provide a higher level of support early on, over time there should be a progressive development of learners owning their own spaces and engaged in their own interactions. Now some of the tools, again, I've, I've mentioned a raft of them, but we, basically my experience has been anything that people can get their hands on will get used. So we've had people who've used PageFlakes, that have used Facebook, that have used Second Life, they've used Digo, they've used, uh, I think it was uh, tr 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 uh, Trailfire at the time, uh, they've used uh, just literally any number of spaces. Google Groups has been popular as well. So if somebody is familiar with it, they will likely start to use it. And I've always encouraged uh, uh, students as well, uh, and this is my way of covering my butt for poor design. I've often said, if you come into this course and you find there's something that I should have done that I didn't do, that's a brilliant invitation for you to go out and do it. You know, set up that group that I didn't set up or that you think I should have. Or if I didn't set up the right, uh, maybe I didn't set up a weekly tweet chat for people in the course, that's great. I mean, the, the way that collaborative distributed courses work is everybody contributes their creativity rather than just relying on one person to give them the cues. Eventually, we want to get to a point where we're queuing off of each other, everyone is, rather than just taking your cues from the primary faculty member. What are your thoughts on that? What are some of the challenges that you see or some of the concerns that you see arising in a UNISA context if I start to say, plan your own spaces of interaction? There and then there. Um, again, sorry. But uh, the big issue is all of our stuff, our courseware and things happens behind the firewall for security issues, hacking material, um, you know, we have a policy for digital, what, what, what. Um, and, and, and it, you can't legally, I think, take stuff from behind the firewall and put it outside the firewall. Um, maybe that what Athabasca made you do with the, the both the four credits separate from the free one. But um, I don't know, Paul, is there an answer there? Am I, am I missing something obvious? But because I could see we have a lot of places that ties in with the, the, the previous plenary, where we could really do, we could MOOCify, if that's a verb, a, a one, an open educational resource as a testing it, but it would have to be then public. So how do we mix the public and secure issues? I guess that's the question. Yeah, I mean the biggest one there is can you move content from behind a paywall or a uh, you know, password protected wall can you move that to a public domain site? That's what I've done in the past. And I've found, again, this doesn't always work, but uh, sometimes permission is much more desirable, or less, let me rephrase that, permission is less desirable than forgiveness. And so in a lot of instances, I've taken content, and because they're my courses typically, and I've just put, even if I haven't 100% duplicated, I've put the readings on Wikispaces. So typically I'll mirror a site or a course on Wikispaces simultaneously for the content, but I'm not sure if you can comment on that. Is there a way we can leave the content behind the firewall and take the learning outside? The, con the learning is not in the content. The content is a starting page. I still find it helpful though, uh, for a lot of individuals, it's kind of, I'm not sure if you've ever been to a session uh, where you're supposed to sort of collaborate and do something, and you're supposed to sit there and start. And the hardest thing is to start somewhere sometimes, right? But if someone says something provocative and irritating, then that begins to serve as almost that social lubricant. So I think in that regard, content plays that role. So I find it's helpful if you can say, here are a few resources or readings. Because the other thing is, it's not that we have to duplicate everything. So when we're teaching a course, I don't want to say that, you know, everybody has, I mean, I would first of all I'd say yes, you know, everybody can have their own opinion, but you don't necessarily get your own facts, right? And there is research literature in fields that we need to align ourselves to. And so you can't, you, you want to learn to become a scientific thinker where not every idea is valid. So somebody can say, well, I believe that, uh, you know, we have seasons for this reason. I'll talk about that actually a little more tomorrow, but uh, you don't, you're not, in, not everybody's entitled to have their own opinion on why we have seasons. There is current scientific thinking that tells us why we have seasons. And that's what 
it's accepted. So we need to measure learner engagement by that. So I think the value of content is to begin to initiate some factual discussions, but over time we do want to develop learner capacity to become scientific thinkers on their own by their involvement with one another and people begin to fact check each other. That's one of the things I absolutely love, you know, the, the Twitter fact checking space, which in some cases does a better job than traditional media does. If you look at some recent discussions in the U.S. around the presidential campaign, uh, you know, there was recently one individual stated he ran a marathon in two hours and 50 minutes. Well, you know, people don't accept that anymore the way you might have in the past, and be, you can access it very easily or search it more easily. It ended up he ran a marathon in four hours and, you know, a minute or two. There's a small difference there, right? One is nearly world class, the other is, oh, that makes sense. Right, so anyway, that's what I'm saying. The same thing happens in courses. Fact checking is much more prominent when everyone has access to discovery tools. I think there's a comment here. Okay, the biggest problem that I see with this one is getting it to us, into our students' heads that being educated is not something that, oh God, I don't know how to put it, it's not about what's written on the piece of paper. Learning is not the content. Because at this stage, if it is not written down somewhere on a piece of paper, they don't study it. They don't care about it. They're not interested in it. It's one of those things that the discussion is on between me and my students at the moment. Are you here to get a piece of paper? Or are you here to gain knowledge to take you further in life? Because if you were here for paper, I can print it out and frame it and put it on your wall. It's as easy as that. Getting that into their heads that studying from a piece of paper is not what you are here for. You are here to learn a skill, gain knowledge, interact with each other, actually grow your mind. Yeah. But they are interested in the paper and the paper only. Well, I think there's a re I mean, in, we have to be pragmatic about how we do this. The context will be very distinct as well. So what works with one class might not work with another. What works in one discipline might not work in another. What works in, you know, at, at an undergraduate level will be a different experience at a graduate level. So I think, you know, while we often talk about ideas in a generalized context, it's important to remember that they're, they're implemented in very specific instances. So when I say, you know, yes, you should teach online and content should be an invitation to interaction, that's going to be reflected differently in different kinds of courses. So there is no, oh, that, that, in fact, that's very much, to have that view is very much against what we're trying to do with open online courses, where we're trying to get down to contextualized, nuanced, deep understanding of subject areas. So what I would say in an instance like that is, uh, there with courses I've done, I've found that the first time someone takes an open course in this format, it's not a pleasant experience at the front. A lot of people rant and rave and they're disoriented and they're confused and they're, they're very, they're not enjoying it necessarily. But people who've gone through a course once, I've found the second, third and multiple times through, it's, it's like anything else. When you're doing something new, in this case this open course format, you're developing a new set of literacies and you're developing a new way of interacting with information and knowledge. Or to go back to a statement I used earlier, you're experiencing what the network does to education. And that means that it's not neatly framed and packaged. You sometimes have to explore and navigate and connect and find other places and examples. So if you're doing it the first time and you have a group of students that are there for just that piece of paper, you may not want to go and dive 100% in with, this, with a, an open online format you may want to take a progressive developmental approach where you might start traditionally for the first two or three weeks, then week four or five or six, you're moving to a slightly more distributed model and bringing in external resources and so on and you're getting more and more distributed as you go along because it is a capacity development uh, aspect as well with this kind of format. Yes? Um, what would you say uh the main skills a learner should have in order to be able to take up a, a MOOC? That's a great question and, and uh, I think the skills I would say is basically to think in networks. If I was to reduce it to something. There are certain mindsets that are helpful. Being able to tolerate ambiguity is important because most times students come in and they say, George, tell me what I'm supposed to know. And it's almost like I, I, might, I might have used this example when I was here last year, but a lot of our students 
are Pavlovian conditioned. And so what that means is when you put them in a class, they immediately assume the role of a learner. And so they expect you to tell them what they need to know. And even educators who can be dynamic presenters in the front of a classroom, once they start taking a course, they become passive recipients. And uh, so I think that really is a conditioned effect. So that's one thing, is to be able to, to, to let students know you have permission to be creative in this course. Uh, you have permission to fill gaps that I have not properly addressed, either in content or in design or interaction. So that would be one element, giving students permission to be creative. Uh, certainly the tolerance of ambiguity, knowing that uh, you, you, the process of learning and coming to know is one that is, is uh, it's, it can be frustrating. It's much harder to explore ideas and interact with ideas meaningfully than it is to have somebody say, this is the formula, and then you repeat the formula back to them, right? Uh, so, so that's more difficult to do. So setting students' expectation that it's going to be a knowledge building experience is helpful as well. Um, the other aspect is it's, it's, it's this whole mess of becoming a network learner, which means learning that content doesn't reside in its entirety in one area. You're going to find bits and pieces. And that you have to develop skills of reflection so that you're going to stop and look at what did I encounter today? Where's their conflict with what I already know? What's the evidence for the opinions that I'm sharing with others? How are other people responding to me? Who am I connected with? And I find this too, um, I'm not sure what it's like on Twitter, and I know academia typically is more left-leaning than, than uh, other segments of society can be, but sometimes I get irritated by the proliferation of left-leaning voices in my Twitter stream. And so I intentionally go out and solicit right-wing perspectives because it's not healthy for a person intellectually to stay in a space that provides unitary message or uniform messages. So that's another skill, letting people learn to self-recognize when you're getting messages that aren't reflective of the diversity of opinions that comprise a society. So I mean, and I could go on and on and on, but ultimately it's about learning to recognize that you are part of a network and that requires technological and conceptual skills that often are not being used in a traditional classroom. Okay, so if you've planned your spaces, the next thing you'll probably want to spend some time on is planning interactions. And this is quite critical because um, you, you want to think through how are people going to connect when they're in the course. This is related to the spaces that you create, obviously, uh, but you might also say, well, you know, I'm going to use course tags. Or another tool, I use Digo constantly. Uh, you know, it's a great tool for creating sub-learner clusters, so if I teach a course formally, uh, through the university, I'll have students join a sub-network and typically, you know, if you go to diigo.com slash user slash G Siemens, um, there's a list of the tags and the resources that, and there's an RSS feed if you really care, but a list of resources that I've tagged over the last five or six years. Um, and these are articles that I frequently search or look at when I'm trying to make sense of, of what's going on. So that's the value of trails and tags, because if you use a course tag, then anybody can tag it by that course, and everyone else gets access to that tag. So you very quickly have students helping you build the knowledge base within a particular field as well. So think through, you know, are you going to have synchronous components to your course, you know, live interactions? Maybe you're going to use Google Hangout, uh, which, you know, for broadcast purposes, so it's if you have that kind of uh, internet quality, or perhaps you're going to use a synchronous chat. You can even use a quasi-synchronous chat, uh, such as, uh, let's say, a Twitter uh, monthly, weekly, whatever, uh, tag meeting for that course where you spend time with other people talking about that in a text-only format and other, other uh, elements as well. What are you going to do for asynchronous interactions and so on? So this is interaction. This is not yet learner um, assessment or the content that learners are producing. An important one, though, uh, this is sometimes uh, you can forget this, but it's very important that you think through how are you going to have a continual presence. So it's important to note with these course formats that you know you aren't the central node in a network course because networks aren't hub spoke models the way that this course is. I mean this is all of you looking at me in a network course we you know different people would be looking at each other and interacting to a greater degree. So while you're not the central node you're still a very important node and so you need to still be continually involved, whether that's active in email discussion forums or other areas. But rather than trying to dominate the conversation, you're just kind of there so that people know that, yeah, George is still reading uh, or is still involved in the course in some capacity. 
So continued presence. Think through how you're going to model and create a continued presence throughout the course. And let your learners know, is your continued presence going to be A, I will actively Twitter. I will actively post resources to this Digo group. You need to join it if you want access to that. Or perhaps you're going to set up a Mendeley research group and you're going to invite them to your research group and you're going to actively share academic articles that way. However you do it, but be upfront and say, this is where and how I'll participate in this course. Seventh point, you're almost full-blown mookers, is uh, learner creations and activities. So you want to think through what will learners create. And I have a very specific view on this. Um, I think that when we interact with ideas, whether it's in a course or whether we interact with ideas when we're, we're uh, you know, the various pieces, we, we listen to a TED Talks, we catch a, a link to an article uh, or a research paper that came in a local newspaper, or we have a conversation with someone in a hallway. We're constantly acquiring bits and pieces of the world and we're in this process of ongoing sense making as we encounter those bits and pieces and, and those ideas. When periodically we need to pause and integrate those ideas and validate them and critique the ones that maybe don't belong because we get a lot of false information also daily through our interactions. So we at a certain point have, I've used the word before, but where we need to form a narrative of coherence. But that's where we sit down and we try and make sense of, okay, how does this piece that I heard this week about the social climate in Canada relate to this part over here that I learned about new budget constraints in our province, relate to this point over here that relates to you know, this global trend in higher education. So that time, the, this, the generation of some kind of a sense-making artifact is an opportunity for you to form coherence around a subject area or discipline. And I'll, I'll yip about that more tomorrow. But for now, I just want to emphasize that, um, and hopefully, I'm, you don't mind if I use you as an example, Paul, because everybody's picking on you today anyway. But uh, Paul uh, writes uh, an exceptional blog, and so on a weekly basis, you can access uh, his thinking. And the, the discipline to write once a week is, I think, a very valuable intellectual activity to allow you to integrate and pull together some of those pieces that you encountered that week. So what I do periodically is I'll sit down, I'll look at the Digo resources I've tagged, because I'll typically tag anywhere from, from 10 to 20 a day. And I'll look at uh, perhaps some tweets that I've favorited, and I will look at uh, uh, articles that I've uploaded to Mendeley, and I'll just sort of try and get a sense of what's changed, what's the landscape look like, how do these pieces connect. And so that is a sense-making activity that I think is very valuable for students to engage in. So what you do is when you engage in this kind of activity around a course topic, you create, whether it's a blog post or an image or a YouTube video or something, doesn't matter what you create, could be an essay, what you're really doing is demonstrating to others how you see these course pieces fitting together. And then by doing that, you then serve the role of teaching others. So your sense-making artifact is a learning point for other people who encounter that artifact. So that's again, getting back to this notion of, of you know, becoming a network thinker and a network learner. Now we have to get uh, down to the you know, sad realities of blatant promotion. If you've now put together a great course, you've thought through how you're going to participate and keep your profile active as the course progresses, you've spent some time thinking about the activities, the creations that you want learners to engage in, you've, you've chosen your teach, who you're going to co-teach with, you've put all of these content pieces together, now you've got a course. It's time to get out, the word out and start promoting. And I typically find, try and go for months, not weeks, because it takes a while for a message to sort of spread. And so uh, there's a variety of circles that you can look at for getting the, the, the message out. Certainly your students, perhaps colleagues, uh, listservs that you're maybe a member of, and let others know the course that you're offering. You know, all of you are part of an academic discipline and you interact with that discipline in different ways. So I would say a great example is put together a MOOC in whatever your, your discipline is and then share it with that network and uh, either invite contribution or just engage with them in that regard. But then get it out to your own network as well. You know, if you're active on Twitter or Facebook or other areas, uh, share the message with your course topic. It's a free course. There's, you know, no commitment for individuals. So be upfront on what to expect and what's going to happen. Now, if it's a course that you're excited about, if you're passionate about, you know, that'll come through. You know, people will pick up on sort of the momentum and the energy that you're bringing to it as well and uh, it will help sort of get the word out. And if you've done a good job picking a topic that's relevant, if you've targeted the right audience with that topic, then chances are you won't have a huge issue in getting at least enough students in to call it a course. 
The other aspect is iterate and improve. So now you've started your course, you got the word out, you got 20 students that joined, maybe you got 100 or more, and at this point, you're, and you may have done a blended model. You might have one group that you're teaching in your university that you're doing for credit marking and evaluation. There's another group that you've just made the content, the resources, the lectures available for free. You've maybe asked them to blog or to use a course tag. And so you need to plan for fluidity so that you're continually adjusting and changing. Listen to what your course participants are telling you. What do you need to improve? But also be very transparent. Um, you know, the point that I've emphasized in the past is if you're a transparent learner, you're a teacher. Because people who are observing what you're doing, they're getting the benefit of your insight and how you develop. And that's why I find it's, it's actually, I'm disheartened by the, the uh, strong uh, peer review criteria that sometimes comes up in higher education because what we're really teaching the students when we say only cite these exceptionally well-written articles that have gone through an editorial process and a multiple review process, what we're telling them is the product matters. And yet in education we're always saying, no, it's the process, the process matters, that, that's what's important. So as academics, then we should also exhibit and publicly reflect our process of learning and coming to know by participation in blog writing or by participation in social media. Anyways, that's the process. Few quick points here before I do a bit of uh, sham wow advertising, but uh, set your expectations. Be reasonable about the size, uh, doesn't matter if you've got 15 plus students, I think in that range you can teach a course. What's most important of the course, the first few that you offer anyways, will be your own learning, not even your students' learning. Another point to remember, it'll probably take more time than you can imagine. So if you think, I'm going to spend five hours a week on this, you're wrong. If you think, I'm going to spend 40 hours a week on this, you're probably wrong. Uh, I don't mean to scare you off actually, but it, it does take a commitment, but you'll find it's a very rewarding commitment and uh, you'll enjoy it and it'll feel much like Chick Sant Mahai has talked about in terms of flow. You'll very much have that experience of flow where the experience of learning is, uh, is not one that is, is friction oriented, it's, it's fairly fluid in that regard. I do think it'll also change how you teach and how you learn and sadly you'll also find yourself saying things that cause other faculty members at meetings to look at you and say, I don't know what you're talking about, but uh, that comes from the experience of seeing there's a way to learn that, that is not antagonistic to the network, that's not antagonistic to the web, and that's essentially what MOOCs do, is try and align the learning experience with the dominant mode of information dissemination in our society today. If you want to suffer with me, two courses, this is one that uh, starts October 8th to 16th, it's on the future of uh, higher education. And so we'll look at a variety of topics from data and analytics to uh, what's happening in different parts of the world uh, from an education institution perspective, research and otherwise. And secondly, this course starts next week on openness in education. This is a pleasant 12-week struggle which we're, uh, we'll look at uh, just what's happening around the openness model in higher education. And uh, we've got four minutes for questions. Three actually, it just changed on me. So any comments or thoughts? Could you see yourself teaching an open online course? I mean, how many of you think in the next year you'll teach an open online course? Yes, two. I'll take two converts. Three. <laughs> Hallelujah, four. <laughs> All right, so we're up to four. Uh, wow, I've got that. a comment. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm doing a course in ICTs in education with the University of Cape Town, but I also work. And I think. Uh, what I liked about the way we started, we started online before we met for block release face to face. And uh, I think the way the online component was done is that it was quite engaging. By the time we were meeting our students, we were very eager to meet each other hmm. because the number of uh, uh, me measures had been taken using various technologies for us to be able to interact and create our own space and want to meet with each other. So I think uh, from what you are saying, it's right. you are right that it does help in order to facilitate learning. But I know that uh, we are just one of the few in the university doing that. For most of them, they are still doing the traditional way of learning. Yeah. And I, I should say, in certain subject areas and content, that's just fine. Uh, so I'm not saying that the whole world should be like a MOOC. I'm saying teaching, experimenting and innovating with teaching and learning is one of the most important things that educators can do when higher education is in a period of flux. And MOOCs right now are a very promising research and a promising experiment. They're not the solution to what's wrong with higher education. I don't mean to pitch them that way. 
but they are one way to actively gain a sense of the phenomena of education today and get some feedback and probe and understand what's actually occurring. Any other comments? Oh, sorry. Yes, I try to make a comment. Actually, I'm, I'm trying to connect the beginning of your talk to the end. So you started talking about these big initiatives like um, Audacity and Coursera, which are big players in the field with packaged content beautifully written and done and prepared for the learner. The content comes ready, everything is beautiful and easy to use. Right. But what you're showing is something completely different from that, same sort of structure, but something much more challenging and intense. And also, it seems that you're putting a new, a completely new role for the, for the teacher there, which, um, which, which has to, a lot to do with facilitating mediation and facilitating yeah. knowledge. Um, I won't say acquisition because acquisition is not the <laughs> is not the word, but uh, I mean interaction with content and knowledge on yeah. the web, which seems to me to be much more interesting um, because it's challenging. So I don't I don't know if you ever if you think of these big players as, as being a threat for MOOCs or if you think of them as just showcasing how much more interesting learning can be and how much more critical thinking we can prompt our students to do? Uh, it's a very relevant question, and it's probably a bad idea to ever try and connect the start of a presentation I do with something at the end. So that would require sustained focus. Um, no, but on a serious note, though, you, you raise an important point, and there's been quite a bit of pushback within the educational community around the for or the, the for-profit MOOCs, like the example of what we're seeing coming out of uh, Coursera and Udacity and edX. And, uh, but I, I'm more of a frame of mind that a diversity of ideas is important. There, you know, it's too early for us to center around one model or one approach. Uh, my own interest has been very strongly in trying to foster alternative pedagogical models and in emphasizing learner autonomy and learner creativity. So as a result of that emphasis, yes, our, the model that I explained is different from the Coursera. So if you remember early on, I talked X MOOCs, which is the Coursera model, which is neatly packaged, neatly structured, uh, very much emulates a traditional model of knowledge. I know, you don't, I'll talk at you until you know, and then I'll give you a paper that says you've passed. Whereas with MOOCs, it's more like saying, here's a domain of knowledge. Let's explore it together you will have views and experiences that I haven't had. And you'll provide insight to me that even though I've been in the field for a dozen years or 20 years or more, uh, I can learn from. And when you have all of these peers together interacting with one another, they're going to generate a type of knowledge that is different from my perception of that knowledge. There's still going to be facts, there's still going to be research mindsets that are going to be brought to bear, but that's the richness of the learning experience. And I would argue that that's more reflective of what we do in our daily lives as well. In our corporate settings or in our work role, it, we don't get life neatly packaged with problems and solutions found later on. So uh, you, there is a very different approach to these. Uh, there, the word MOOCs have been co-opted really by the four profit or the, the uh, other models that I've mentioned previously. And so as a result, the attention now with MOOCs, because that's what's been popularized, you'll usually see it referenced as you know, the Stanford, the MIT approach, which is fine. I mean, you know, credit isn't nearly as important, I think, as being able to make an impact, even if it's a small cluster of people who take some of those ideas and continue to grow and continue to innovate. So I'm happy that there are other for-profit vendors that are in this space. I might have some issues pedagogically, but still, there's somebody trying to teach someone else, and it's very hard, you know, whether they're preaching in the name of MOOCs or not, at least the general ideas of openness are being shared and interacted around. Well, we are out of time. Uh, I'm three minutes over, so thanks very much for your attention and your comments.